This is Pastor M.D. Lewis speaking on the subject of the sanctuary and uh, particularly the subject of the high priest. <clears throat> you see the robe that I have on is that of the Levitical high priest. As I mentioned previously, the white garment with the blue ribbon around it extends up to the neck and out the arms, is symbolic of the white linen wall that goes completely around the sanctuary, the law of Moses. The blue uh, garment is entirely blue, and it has a gold braiding around the neck to symbolize the Ten Commandments. A chain is a symbol of the law, and a gold chain is a symbol of the perfect law of God. And that is woven around the neck to indicate that if a person will give attention to the uh, law of God, it will be as a gold chain around his neck. You remember that when Daniel interpreted the handwriting on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel Upharsin, they brought forth a gold chain and put around his neck to honor his excellent service. And uh, that is the same meaning of the gold braiding around the neck. Then the beautiful ephod with the breastplate is representative of the most holy place. As I say, the blue, the word for blue in, in, in Hebrew koloth is the word for perfection, and that is the chamber of sanctification. So the priest is wearing the entire robe of righteousness and the whole sanctuary on his person. You recall that I mentioned in a previous study that in the book of Numbers, the eighth chapter, that the priests were brought into the court, the people placed their hands upon them and offered them for a sacrifice. As the Lord said, it was a gift to them from God. So that the priest then took over the position of the individual. So wherever the priest is going in the sanctuary, it is as if the people themselves were moving in the person of the priest. I call your attention <clears throat> to a beautiful verse, verses in the, Pro in the Proverbs, by the wise man, verse 7 of the fourth chapter. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee, and she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thee to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Now this word crown in this text is more meaningful than may appear, although a crown is a beautiful uh, ornament on the head and has the idea of kingship and rulership, but it also has an implication uh, involving the interpretation of the Bible from the book of Genesis to Revelation. The word crown in that particular verse uh, is the Hebrew word safar, and in the Hebrew language, the word safar is the word for frog, because the frog jumps in a semicircle, 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 and for that reason, they gave him the name, which means circle, uh, and that in Hebrew is sapar, and that is the word for crown. Now, the word frog is sapar, that. They add a little eh on the end of it to indicating the croaking of a frog. So, the, uh, you recall the statement in the book of Revelation, and the spirits of devils like frogs, sapar, that will gather the whole world to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. The spirits of devils, like frogs, will gather the whole world because their life has been a life of uh, erratic jumping from here to there, and finally they will come to destruction. But the same word is also used for crown, which is very characteristic of Hebrew, the same word may refer to that which is evil as well as to that which is good, and this is this particular word is no exception. Now, the reason why they speak of it in the sense of around or circle is because it goes around the head. 
Now, in the mitre, that is the name of the whole affair that the high priest wears on his head, uh, on the, uh, of the mitre, it speaks of the crown, which is, as you can see here, a portion coming around, and then it opens up to this gold plate uh, and where the inscription is. So <clears throat> they also call this Nazar in Hebrew, which is the word Nazarite, uh, which referred to the city of Nazareth, and also to Christ, the fact that he was one set aside to be a special work for God, and that is also involved in the crown. But it says here that if you will honor her, that is wisdom, and of course this wisdom refers to the law of God, it will make a crown of life for you. Now, the Jews uh, could understand that. They could read it, and many of them, for some time at least, believed it. But later on, they, they fell into sin and uh, in opposition to God. And in the great book of Lamentations, it uh, makes an observation there that's very significant. It's in the fifth chapter of Lamentations, verse 16. Well, I should read 15 and 16. The joy of our heart is ceased. Our dance is turned into mourning. The crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us, we have sinned. So it's obviously that their sinful life had thrown the crown off from their head, and they recognized that the joy and the, the happiness of their life had ceased. The crown of joy, or the crown of righteousness, uh, upon the head will bring everlasting joy to the person who possesses it. Now, I want to emphasize again the reason why it is called a crown, tzapar in Hebrew, is because it circles the head. Now, circling the head is very significant because inside the head, the thinking also runs in circles. As a man sows, so shall he reap. With whatever you measure out to others will in turn come back and be measured to you. Now, the Hebrews established this fact over and over again. It is the function of the Ten Commandments, and I call your attention to that very significant text in Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6. I will visit, now this is second commandment, I will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate. Now you see, this is a circle. The fathers commit sin of hating God, and uh, as it says in John the eighth chapter, Christ said, the children will do what they see their father do by heredity and environment. So the iniquities of the fathers will be visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. So then the next generation will pass it on to the third and fourth and the next. And so it goes on and on in the human race and runs in the circle of, of hate and destruction. Now that's the function of the mind regulated by the Ten Commandments. Now the next verse in Exodus 20, verse 6 says, I will show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So there the Ten Commandments is divided into a double function, good and evil, but each of them run in a circle. So the fact that this crown is a circle and on his head is indicative of what's going on inside of his head as indicative by the crown on the outside. It is in a circle. And this circle crown here uh, is related to the wheel and it's related to the wheels of Ezekiel when he saw the wheels within a wheel that were governed by the hand of God and the Holy Spirit was going through the earth. Because everything in the earth operates in a circle. Now, I can say this literally, in a sense, because if I turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the wise man will point out to, uh, in nature this very distinctive function. And uh, as it says in the scripture, that which is physical is first, and then that which is spiritual is derived from it. In Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, he sp says, verse 5, the sun also riseth, and the sun goes down, and he hastens back to the place where he arose. 
So the sun has gone over and it goes around and goes back, and then it comes over and it runs back and, and it's going in a circle. Then he says, the, uh, the wind goeth towards the south and turneth about uh, to the north, and it whirls around continually, and the wind returns again according to his circuits. Now, I could show you that the word return, I could show you the word the circuits uh, in these, this particular text are also related to this crown. So the wind blows around and around and around, and it comes back to where it was because it does not leave a vacuum behind it. And then he says, all the rivers run into the sea. But the sea is not full because the moisture is taken up and moved over in the clouds, drops down as rain, and runs back to the, the oh, oh, picked up again, and runs in a circle. Now, you see, he has established here in the laws of physics the sun circuit, the wind circuit, and the water circuit. Now, once he has done that, now he comes with the, uh, with the interpretation of verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. Now, the reason why that which has been is that which shall be is because uh, the law of God is so constructed that whatever a person sows shall return in the crop. And whatever the fathers do shall return in their offspring. So uh, uh, be not uh, dismayed. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 5, 6, and 8. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now I'm saying it is because uh, this is the way the mind runs. This is the way the crown is indicative on the, uh, goes around his head, and it governs his entire body. Now, you know what it says in the Bible, Christ, uh, the head, governs the whole body. All the hands, the feet, and all the digestive processes are governed from the head. So the head operates everything. And you remember, Christ is called the head of the church. And Christ said, I am the head, I am the tail, I am the beginning, and I am the end. Now, it just happens to be in the book Genesis 1-1, the very first word in Hebrew, bereshit, means in the head. It's interpreted in the beginning, and that's very proper. And the last word in Malachi is curse, which is the end. So Christ is not only the head in the sense of righteousness, he is the end in the sense of destruction, the penalty for sin, which is death. And when he suffered death, he suffered the end uh, of the function of the law, which is destruction. So it, he is literally the first letter in Genesis 1-1, and he is the last letter in uh, the book of, uh, of Malachi, the last chapter. So uh, Christ is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning of all righteousness, and he has suffered the consequence of all sin, which is eternal destruction and death. And because we need both of these qualities, the sanctuary is set up to illustrate those two principles. So the head is very important. It governs the whole body. So what's on the head is indicative of what's governing not only the body of the priest, but it's, got, it's governing every aspect of the humanity and also nature. Now, if a person looked into the molecules in the glass of these lens, he'd find uh, an atom, and the atom would have a nucleus, and around the nucleus would be circling certain particles of electricity. And so in this glass, it's going around and around and around. And when we look at the sun and when we look at the stars and know that our great uh, galaxy of the Milky Way, which has 200 billion stars in it, is going around a certain axis and turning. And this whole uh, affair of our galaxy is moving around another center, which is going in a circle. So it could be said that all the physics uh, of the world is in circles, and all the operations of the human mind run in circles. And I can show you this over and over and over in the Bible. So whatever is written on the head is very important because it's written on the mainspring of all the operations of man, humanity, and the entire world. So let's turn to the book of Exodus, the 28th chapter, and look at the uh, description of the priest garments 
And you'll find it in the 28th and 29th chapter of Exodus is where he describes his whole apparel. And I'm reading now from uh, the 28th chapter of Exodus and the 36th verse and 7. And thou shalt plate, thou shalt make a plate of pure gold. Now you see, the moment it says pure gold, you ought to interpret that because gold is a symbol of God's self-sacrificing love. So the gold plate upon which the inscription is made is a symbol of the righteousness or the perfection of God. Write upon the pure gold plate and engrave upon it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Now in Hebrew, it just takes two words. In our language, it takes five or four. So in Hebrew, it is Kodesh La Yehovah. Now you understand the word Kodesh is also the word for sanctuary. It is the word for holiness or sanctification. Sanctification or holiness to the Lord is what is inscribed here in Hebrew. Kodesh La Yehovah. Holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace. Now you'll see that that's the case here. It's mounted upon a blue lace. Now immediately you see, you should interpret the meaning of blue lace. And the word is kaloth in Hebrew, which is the word for perfection or righteousness, which we've already explained in the blue ribbon and in the blue uh, garment that the priest has on. So they were to mount it upon a blue lace that it may be upon the mitre. Upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be, right on the forefront, right on his forehead. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of holy things. Now you understand that Aaron did have this inscription, and it was on his forehead, indicating what his mind should be in behalf of the priest for the people. But obviously Aaron, being a human being, uh, is fallen into sin. So in the sanctuary services they had uh, a service whereby when the priest functioned in very special manners, as in the Day of Atonement, in order to qualify the priest with this particular qualification, uh, uh, Kodesh La Yehovah, or holiness to the Lord, he offered an oxen to cleanse his life from sin, that he could represent the righteousness of the high priest, which is Christ. So he had to go through a process of cleansing to qualify for this inscription. But in the case of Christ, this is also the occasion, as we shall see. So the point I want you to see in the chapter which I just read in the verse, the reason that he has this inscription, Kodesh la Yehovah, holiness to the Lord, is that he may bear the iniquities of the people. Now you see, there would be no necessity of putting sin upon a sinner. There would be no necessity of putting the sins of the human race upon a person whose mind was polluted with sin. If God is going to save the human race, he would have to get a mind that's pure. He'd have to get this mind in the capacity of humanity. Now, if that were possible to get a mind in humanity that is absolutely without sin, and that person could have some connection with deity so that when they put the sins of the whole world upon his mind, his, the purity of his mind would be able to bear it and the capacity of his divinity would bear it for the whole human race. So Christ is the, is the one that is to qualify. So I call your attention again uh, to that magnificent verse in the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verse 24, and call your attention again to contemplate and think of it. Verse 24, uh, John 15, If I had not done among men, among them, that is, among the Jews, the works which none other man did. Now, he doesn't say which none other God-man did, 
which other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. In other words, these people have hated me who lived in the capacity of humanity with the Holy Spirit in his life, which they also had access to, a life of absolute purity. And because he lived it in the capacity which they had available to them, his life convicted them of sin. Now, you see, it could never have convicted them of sin if that uh, particular engraving, Kodesh la Yehovah, holiness to the Lord, was not in his mind. Now, as he comes to the end of his ministry, as found in John, the 17th chapter, as recorded in verse 4, John 17, 4, which, as I said, one is probably the last recorded prayer before Gethsemane, he said, Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have glorified thee. That is, I have represented thee. The word glory in Hebrew, kapet, and the word doxazo in Greek, means to characterize or to manifest the attributes. So uh, Christ said, I have taken humanity from uh, earthly parents, and I have exhibited in it the holiness, the righteousness of God. Now I have finished my work. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That is, he was to come into the human race on the capacity of men, uh, according to the laws of uh, the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, and pick that up and so commit his mind to God. And he did it when he was 12 years of, of age, when he said, I must be about my father's business. He there submits his mind to God that he would not think a thought, he would not do a deed, but what first came through the, the channels of heaven and the, the Heavenly Father before it ever came to his head and to his conduct. So he could say, I am from above. My life is from heaven. Because his mind was completely and totally submitted to God that he would only think and do that which was in the holiness of heavenly intent. Now he never never deviated from that particular uh, uh, commitment and consecration so that his mind developed Kodesh la Yehovah, righteousness to the Lord. Despite the fact that he was living under the handicap of humanity. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in his life that came to him at baptism, and was before in his life, but came in a very remarkable way at baptism, of his anointing, and the glory of the Lord came into his life, and that glory directed his mind in a way of absolute righteousness. Now when he said, Father, I have finished my work, well, the Father said to him, Son, you have glorified me on the earth, and you will yet glorify me again. Now, son, I have one more task for you to do in order to save the human race and fulfill what was written in Exodus 28, 36. Kodesh la Yehovah is on the mitre, is in the mind of the priest, and you are that priest. Now, because of the righteousness in your mind, as it says in Exodus 28, where I read, he would bear the iniquity of the people. So now upon that holy mind, God must impose the iniquity of the human race. Now let me call your attention again to that marvelous text that I uh, called uh, to your attention previously, Isaiah 53, that magnificent chapter on the, the great Messiah the servant of the Lord, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul a sacrifice for sin. Now, the word soul would be the same in Greek and Hebrew in the sense of its uh, uh, manifestation. The word soul here is nephesh in Hebrew, which is the word for mind or soul. So it could be very easily interpreted that uh, 
he hath put him to grief, uh, and he has made his soul an offering for sin. Now, in verse 6 it says, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, you must think this thing through, and you must ascertain when God laid the iniquity of the world upon Christ, or he made his mind a sacrifice for sin, where did Christ take the sins of the human race? Well, he took them where the sinners have them, in their mind. So, in order to pay the penalty for sin, as it will finally uh, be carried out in the lives of the wicked, their mind will realize that they are sinners at the end of the thousand years when they surround the holy city, uh, and they will know then that they're going to die a death in which there is no hope they'll ever live again. Now that is the last turn or circle that the head will make in his final destruction. So Christ, in order to pay the penalty so man may escape it, he must die the same death that sinners will die in the same capacity that sinners will die that death. Now, up until Gethsemane, Christ had the Holy Spirit that came into his life, which was his anointing, which was the power of deity or the power of divinity or the divine power, I should say. But a person must always distinguish this from the person of Trinity. It was a divine power that came into his life and enabled him to submit his mind and keep on the course of Kodesh la Yehovah. But now he has come to the time when he must glorify God in the sense of the penalty of the law. So he goes into the garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane in Hebrew means an olive press because it was in the Mount of Olives where there was a probably a large olive orchard. There he wrestles, apparently among the olive trees. He wrestles with this issue of taking upon him the sins of the world in the symbol of the cup that had a, a, a portion, a potion of wine symbolically representing the sins of the entire world. And he must drink it all, even the dregs, which are very bitter. Uh, if you've ever preserved grape juice in jars, you will note that after a while if there's a crystallization in the bottom of the grape juice, uh, which is uh, very, very bitter, uh, a crystallization, uh, and uh, uh, it, is, it is precipitated into the bottom. It's called the dregs. It's very bitter. Uh, and the word bitter in Hebrew, marah, is also the word for death in Hebrew. So although a person may drink the sweet grape juice when he comes to the dregs, which is bitter, uh, is the experience of death. So Christ must drink the entire contents of the cup. Now you understand this is a symbolic cup, and he's wrestling with the issue of whether or not he would take the sins of the world upon him. And finally he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, it became the will of the Father that he should. And so he takes the cup and drinks the contents. And the sins of the world now come upon his mind. He now is a guilty sinner. For you recall in the book of uh, Romans, the eighth chapter, it says, he became sin for us. Now you must recognize that he is now, in a sense, a member of the Aaronic priesthood who were actually sinners. But the great difference is this. The Aaronic priesthood sinned by an act of their volition. But Christ never sinned by an act of volition. He became a sinner by the act of his will, taking the sins of others. But he took them upon himself as though they were his own. So now, in a sense, not entirely exactly like, uh, like Aaron, as I've already explained, but he now has sin in his mind. 
Now, this mind has never sinned up to that moment. Now comes the great struggle, the controversy, the whole meaning of the sanctuary is now involved in this particular place and issue that the mind of Christ that has been Kodesh La Yehovah has now taken upon this mind the iniquity of unholy things, as it says. He has in his mind, and now his mind becomes the great sacrifice for sin, as it says. He gave his soul or mind a sacrifice for sin. Now, I hope I can point this out to you, uh, and you see what uh, the Bible is revealing here. Now, you keep in mind that when we're talking about the mind of Christ and the law in his heart, we're talking about this piece of furniture. The Ten Commandments is in the ark. The lid of the ark is the conscience. In the sense of Christ's experience, it was pure gold. It had never involved itself in sin. But inasmuch as he is going to become the vicarious uh, uh, sacrifice for the human race and experience death for their violation, then he must take blood of sinners upon his life or the penalty for sin upon his life as the lid would take blood upon the lid. So Christ is going to take the the sins of the human race. Now, don't forget what I said about the circle and the crown on the head involves what you sow, you reap. Now, if Christ takes the seed and the sins of sinners in his mind, what would be the ordinary conduct that would come out of that? The hatefulness and the sinfulness of the human beings. Now, you understand there are two seeds in his head, so to speak. There is the seed of righteousness, which has been his life. Then there are the sins of the wicked, which is the seed of iniquity. Now, you remember the Bible said, whosoever is born of God that cannot sin because his seed remains in him. The righteousness of Christ, the mind of Christ remains in him. But now Christ has in his mind also the seed, the mind of the wicked. Now, which of the two is going to manifest itself? And how is it going to manifest itself in the great sacrifice of the altar of sacrifice, the cross of Calvary, uh, where Christ will go from Gethsemane to Calvary and there will experience the last great controversy in his mind between the two. Now, to make it uh, more realistic and to reveal the great attack that Satan was making on the, the master at that time, Satan knew that if he should ever uh, foil or uh, abort the great plan of salvation, he must lead Christ into sin. Well, all during his life, when he was in the wilderness 40 days, and all during his life, Satan plagued him in ever endeavoring to bring uh, iniquity to his life, but he failed. But Satan knew that his golden opportunity would yet come, because in order for Christ to save the world, he must take sin into his mind, and that would give Satan the opportune moment to wipe him out. Christ, Satan could not get sin into Christ's life during his, during his lifetime. But now that he takes the sins of the world into his mind, Satan thought, now I've got an opportunity into his mind. If I can just press it through his will, I will foil the plan of salvation, abort the salvation of the human race, and the whole affair would be lost. Now, to make it more, more intent and to, to lead Christ into this experience, uh, Satan saw to it that uh, the people in the trial of Christ would heap upon him every insult, would afflict his body and his soul with every, every inhumane torture, that he might respond to that torture in the nature of sinners whose conduct is in his mind. So they would take their finger and reach into his beard and yank the, the hair right out of his face and leave a blotch of blood oozing out where they had pulled out the hair.
Now you understand, this treatment was illegal to prisoners before they were convicted. Now it would have been the ordinary manner of sinners whose sins are in his mind to say, you have no right to do that. And had he retaliated like that, he would have retaliated to iniquity as sinners retaliate and the whole plan of salvation would abort. They doubled up their fist. They hit him in the jaw and in the face so hard they knocked him down. They did it repeatedly until his face was swollen, his eyes were swollen, his lips were all puffed where they had beat him with their fist. It says in Desire of Ages, had you known him before and had seen him after the trial, you would have never recognized who he was. For the Bible said he had a vision marred more than any man. They put a crown of thorns on his head and then they hit him with sticks and clubs over the head and drove those thorns into his flesh around his skull, which bled very profusely. The thorns are a symbol of sin and they were pressing into his, uh, the flesh around his skull indicating the great suffering and the pangs of, of banishment from God that sin was causing uh, was happening in his mind. The tremendous pressure on his mind of the sins of the world was far more than we'll ever imagine and throughout the ceaseless ages we'll try to, to study this and never find it out. If you would have seen his back where they hit him with those lashes 40 times save one, which would be 39, and they did it twice, which would be 78 times. You can imagine how his back would look when they removed his garments and lashed him with this great lash with a, a long handle, giving him a tremendous leverage with rawhide, with little pieces of metal in the end, so as they come down and hit the back, they pull it as it hits the flesh, and the little metal cuts the welt open so that his back would just be uh, torn by the metal and the leather uh, and bleeding uh, profusely. Now you can imagine how he was feeling. Satan was treating him in such a manner to get him to retaliate as the sins of the whole human race were in his mind. But every time he opened his mouth to speak, and the blood was coming down his face. And as he spake and his breath came out, it would sputter the blood out. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, my dear people, I want you to see the great meaning of this sanctuary. He gave his mind a sacrifice for sin. He must permit the sins to take him on an experience with God and so separate him from God as to take him into a death in which he knew in his mind he would never live again. Now he does this in Gethsemane, which means olive press, which means squeezing out the oil, which means squeezing out the oil of this light, which is the Holy Spirit. In other words, by squeezing the Holy Spirit out of his life, and he has in his mind the, the sins of sinners, he is now a physical, mortal sinner. The same capacity the human race who are lost around the holy city at the end of time, their capacity and their uh, their lives will be in the same status as his life, a mortal sinner. They don't have the Holy Spirit in their life or they couldn't say, they couldn't experience a death from separation from God. And Christ couldn't have experienced a death in separation from God if he did have the Holy Spirit in his life. So Gethsemane means to press out the olive oil and the sins of the world in his mind was pressing out the, the relationship with God and separate him until he cried out in Hebrew, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, why have you left me? That is the experience of the sins in his mind, fulfilling every sacrifice that was ever offered in the sanctuary. Now the question is, will he hold on to the Kodesh la Yehovah 
of which is inscribed on the mitre of the priest. By his understanding of God's goodness and by the understanding of the righteous life that he had lived, which he still had, but only in the capacity of humanity, he held on to God in his mind, although it was pressing and pressing, the sins were pressing upon his mind that the blood issued and oozed out in the perspiration of his face. The great weight of the sins of the world upon his mind so restricted the capillaries and the arteries and veins of his body that it was difficult to get the blood through the circulation and the pump was in, under a tremendous uh, uh, obstacle of pumping the blood through the courses of his body with the great anxiety and the of his mind of being separated from God, a dying a death in which there was no hope. Until finally, the muscle of his heart ruptured. And with a tremendous scream of pain, his head fell forward. Savior was dead. But the inscription on his forehead was still there. Kodesh, La Yehovah, holiness to the Lord. And that was the security of your everlasting life. And that is the central theme of every sacrifice that goes through the sanctuary service. And it is that particular priesthood who in the heavenly sanctuary in this apartment and from 1844 in the last apartment will put the blood that came down his forehead that was oozing from his back put it on that lid to cleanse your conscience as his conscience was clear in the experience of Calvary so that you may escape the penalty of everlasting separation from God because your life has been so molded to Jesus as he said let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And God will finally bring that into your experience. And on the resurrection morning, you will be resurrected with the mind and holiness of Christ as if you had never sinned to enjoy the pleasure of eternal life with Christ and the saints throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Could you afford to miss that experience? by turning down the opportunity to understand these great principles in the sanctuary service. There is no revelation in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that depicts the plan of salvation and the philosophy of Christ's life as your Savior, as does the sanctuary. In fact, you will never find out the depth of the Bible truths without a study of the sanctuary. Righteousness by faith cannot be explained without these apartments. And the knowledge of Christ as our personal Savior will not be made as clear as it can be by a physical exhibition of three apartments, three doors, and seven pieces of furniture running through the entire model of the sanctuary. This particular subject is going to become more prominent among the Adventist people than it ever has been in the past. This particular subject will be the great hope of the saints, and those who have it will be saved, and those who have neglected it will be lost, as it says on page 78, early writings. And although there are some who may think that this is going to pass away because it's only a myth, it's going to become a reality more and more in the lives of the saints because the revelation of this subject and the, uh, the aspect of the holy and the most holy place are the distinctive doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists. And this uh, distinction is going to become more and more prominent. In the next few years, this subject will be far more known among our people and revered among them than it has in the past two or three decades. Because the subject of the sanctuary is the subject of our relation with Jesus Christ and his soul as sacrifice for sin for our redemption. And this will become a greater truth.
as time goes by. Do you want to experience the victory of Christ's life in your life that you may have the assurance on the resurrection morning that when he comes we shall be resurrected as holy and as perfect as was the humanity of Christ. This is our hope, this is our understanding, and this is our truth. And by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, may you make that your experience now and forevermore. Amen. It's been a pleasure to bring these lectures to you.